Around the world, there are 16.7 million reservoirs with a surface area greater than 100 square meters. Many of these are located in arid or semi-arid areas, and that means evaporation. How much water evaporates away depends on the location, geography, as well as the local conditions, but it can be quite significant. Considering how much of the United States is water stressed, we cannot really afford to let 20, 30, or even 40% of this water vanish before our eyes, right? So in this video, we're going to talk about reservoir evaporation suppression techniques, and also touch briefly on the controversy of shade balls. But first, I want to remind you about the newsletter. Check out the newsletter to read the entire scripts for previously released videos, including those you might not have seen before. The sign up link is in the video description below. I try to put one out every week, maybe two. All right, back to the show. So how big is this problem? How much water are we actually losing anyway? Part of the reason why evaporation effects have been largely ignored in water management has partially to do with how difficult it is to measure and calculate. But once you are capable of measuring this, we can see that the losses are significant. In the state of Queensland, in Australia, the estimate is that 1 billion cubic meters, 40% of the total capacity of 2.5 billion, is evaporated away, while in Spain, that number is about 10%. And over in the United States, a study of 200 reservoirs in Texas showed an annual loss of about 20% of the reservoir's active storage capacity. Studies of evaporative losses in Lake Superior and Lake Tahoe averaged some 40-60% to 60 of the total water budget. In the case of Lake Tahoe, more water is evaporated away into the air than is actually consumed. All of this water evaporating away has significant economic effects, especially since much of the reservoir water is used for irrigation and agriculture. Going back to the Queensland example, the amount of water that packs up and goes into the air is estimated to be enough to irrigate 125,000 hectares each year, worth almost $375 million of agriculture. As various areas in the world find themselves increasingly hit by long, brutal droughts, evaporation suppression technologies become increasingly feasible. The physics of water evaporation are deceptively simple. The rate at which water evaporates off a reservoir is determined by the magnitude of the differences in the vapor pressure between the water on that reservoir's surface and the air. The bigger the difference, the faster evaporation happens. So, the fastest evaporation rates occur when the reservoir water is warm and the air is cold, dry, and windy. But translating this physics principle into real life is tricky because the real world is complicated and full of feedback mechanisms. For instance, the process of water evaporating consumes energy which decreases the water body's temperature, negatively affecting the evaporation rate. And the reservoir's unique local properties have a significant role to play as well. These include the reservoir's surface area and its volume. A deep body of water with a small surface area evaporates more slowly than a shallow one with a wide surface area. The local landscape and climate has a big part to play as well. Unhindered high winds accelerate evaporation rates, but many reservoirs exist in areas of complex geographies, like valleys and gorges, and vegetations, like trees and such. Another important factor takes into account when the reservoir is holding water. For Australia, which is on the southern hemisphere, the months from December to February are the summer months, and that is when the reservoirs dry up the fastest. The complexity of this stuff makes it hard to measure and model. The most commonly cited baseline model is the penman monteith model. This is a formula standardized by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, originally designed to calculate how much water evaporates out of the soil or the cavity of a plant. The penman monteith is not an easy equation to understand, but it takes into account wind speed, air temperature, water temperature, solar radiation, and reservoir depth to give us an approximation of evaporation losses between two points in time. The difficulties of collecting data for this equation and calculating its results has resulted in several studies trying to create quote-unquote approximate equations that take into account fewer of these variables to varying effects, more or less. The first modern evaporation suppression method begins with what are called monolayer molecular films. These are a chemical form of evaporation suppression in which we create a single insoluble chemical layer. There are two ways it keeps water from evaporating away. 
First, it sits on top of the water's surface and physically prevents the water molecules from escaping into the air. And second, the oil reduces the surface tension of the water, which lowers the available surface area of water available to evaporate away. Chemicals like these have been researched since the 1920s, but it got a lot of publicity in the 1950s when the Australian government tried it, reporting a 30% reduction in evaporation rates. This caught a lot of people's attention around the world. Generally, the chemicals chosen are fatty alcohols, long chains of carbons derived from natural fats and oils. One widely used commercial solution is called Water Saver. This is available as a white powder blend. You put it on the water and it creates an invisible film that spreads itself out on top of the water's surface via a special chemical reaction. Water Saver is fully biodegradable within two days, so people often buy little machines that float around, automatically spreading it on the water whenever needed. They have been deployed in Australia, Singapore, and the United States. When used in ideal conditions, it regularly cuts evaporation rates by an estimated 30%. There are no recorded negative effects on water safety, quality, or the environment. That is great, but real-world gains are highly dependent on the weather conditions. High winds, bacteria, intense sunlight, and dust particles can weaken their effectiveness. We need more than a chemical layer. Shades seem to be the most obvious solution. If we feel hot under the sun, then we go under the shade. Do the same for our water. Studies have shown that throwing shade can be very effective. One trial done in 2005 by the Queensland Department of Natural Resources and Mines used cables to suspend a black single filament cloth over the reservoir. The framework is freestanding with the cables anchored to the wall, and it looks like a huge spider web with cables crossing over at multiple points, meaning that they are best installed when the reservoir is empty. This shade cover seems to work quite well. The trial evaluation found that the shade cloth reduced evaporation rates by 60 to 80 percent. Other floating covers act basically like a lid, and so can do even better, up to 90 percent reduction, especially during the summer months. But being a physical item, there are maintenance and damage concerns to consider. The frame is estimated to last about 30 years, with the cloth itself estimated to go about half of that. But when it rains, the water gathers on top of the shade covers, causing it to sag and maybe break, while attracting animals like ducks. Damage from weather, wind, and animals, all of this adds additional cost. The maintenance and economic concerns of physically applying shade covers to reservoirs make them difficult long-term or economically prudent propositions, particularly for very large, heavily used reservoirs. So, what about having the shades float right on top of the water? This is the concept of floating shade covers. There are two types of that floating shade cover, a continuous one and a modular one. The continuous one is just one piece of plastic, wax, or foam, usually polyethylene plastic. The modular one involves individual items that freely float around. It can be shaped like a basin, hexagon, or ball, and experiments have shown that they can cut evaporation rates by some 80%. There are some biological floating shade covers, aquatic plants like duckweed and water lily. A study in Thailand found that using duckweed can reduce evaporation rates by 10%. Though it should be noted that some water plants actually accelerate water evaporation. Their big leaves suck it up and it evaporates out of their pores. And randomly introducing aquatic plants to warm water reservoirs has water quality effects. One notable type of floating shade cover is the floating photovoltaic panel. There is a double benefit here of reducing evaporation and generating electricity with the downside of coverage and cost. Before we move on, we should discuss the California shade ball controversy. A floating shade ball is a small sphere about 10 centimeters wide and made of high density polyethylene. Their effectiveness in significantly cutting evaporation rates has held up in various trials in Spain China, Egypt, Brazil, and Australia. Based on these results, in 2008, the California government proposed the idea of putting 400,000 shade balls in the Ivanhoe Reservoir in 2008. A few years later, in 2014-15, they put nearly 100 million shade balls in their largest reservoir. This was largely for three reasons. One, they helped to prevent evaporation, obviously. And two, they prevent the formation of a hazardous chemical called bromate which forms when the chlorine in the water is exposed to sunlight. And three, they help keep birds away. Apparently, the original idea came from a biologist who saw airports using quote-unquote bird balls to keep birds from gathering in bodies of water at the airport. 
California officials mentioned that the shade balls saved about 1.1 billion liters of water a year from evaporating away, which is good Californians need every drop of those for their big lawns of theirs. The controversy, if I suppose one can call it that, was whether or not making the shade balls used up more water than they saved from evaporating in the reservoir. As I mentioned, the balls are made of polyethylene, which requires natural gas, oil, and energy to make. Several calculations found that the balls use more water than they save unless they're used for about three years or more. But Los Angeles removed many of these shade balls in 2017 and replaced them with shade covers, floating or otherwise. So, during their 1.5-year deployment from August 2015 to March 2017, they might have saved 1.7 billion liters of water but used up 2.9 billion in their manufacture, a net loss. I wouldn't quite say that was the fairest assessment. The shade balls are rated for about 10 years. The main issue seems to be that many of the shade balls were removed from some reservoirs after the drought ended. There are some other concerns with the balls. Most people generally don't like how they look. And I do admit that they're kind of ugly floating there on the water doing plastic ball things. Furthermore, people worry about the potential health effects associated with drinking water that has had plastic sitting in it for a long time. For instance, a concern that these shade balls can add more microplastics or disruptive chemicals like BPAs into the water. That all being said, these are effective. And as far as I can tell, shade balls are still present in a few Southern California reservoirs that are too large to have shade covers. Since wind is so important to the evaporation process, adding windbreaks can, in theory, help with evaporation. Several studies in Australia found that if you plant a bunch of trees near a dam or reservoir, you can reduce wind speeds at the water level by 80% or so, depending on the height of the tree. This correlates to an evaporation reduction of about 4 to 8%, which does not sound like a whole lot considering the other measures we have here. And since trees are big and all, this can only be economically feasible for smaller reservoirs. Bubbles. This one might seem a little random, but bear with me here. The idea behind bubble injection is that during the summer, the water near the surface gets warmer. A natural barrier called a thermocline forms between this layer of warmer water and the colder water down below. This natural phenomena is referred to as stratification, and it prevents the water from mixing together. So what we are trying to do here with the bubble plumes is to break up this stratification and mix the water. This idea was first suggested back in 1962 and was first deployed at Lake Wolford in California. The trial result found an estimated improvement of about 6% annual water evaporation reduction, a 15% reduction during the summer months, and an actual 9% increase in evaporation during the winter. So this works best with deep reservoirs over 18 meters deep where you're more likely to get the cold water layers. And unfortunately, you do tend to mess with local ecosystems with this method. These stratifying water layers can affect fish species. Here's a wild one. If you're worried about your reservoirs drying up, then why not move them underground? This is where you purposely inject water back into the ground in order to recharge an aquifer. The methods used depend on the local climate and the geology. The most common mechanism for this is to use an injection well, which injects stuff down a well. Such equipment is usually used for enhanced oil recovery though, rather than aquifer recharge. The Gulf countries have been particularly interested in this, which makes sense considering their climate. It helps them store water especially for agricultural use. Case studies in Abu Dhabi have found that some 88-100% to of the water can be recovered without a large detriment to water quality. Evaporation suppression techniques need to be implemented as part of a greater strategy that also includes water conservation, recycling, and more. This is true. That being said, the continued challenge of estimating evaporation losses significantly influences policies to address them. The venture capitalist John Durer wrote a book called Measure What Matters. You can't economically address evaporation until you can measure it. Recently, new innovations in remote sensing and machine learning have shown high potential in addressing these with higher accuracy. I am particularly impressed by a 2019 paper by two researchers at Texas A&M University who used Landsat data to estimate evaporation losses of 721 reservoirs down to the local level, making it extremely practical for management. To conclude this rather dry video, I wanted to leave us with a joke about water evaporation, but it just seemed to vanish into thin air. <laughs>
All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.